Hello, hello, welcome to the video. The day this video is going up on is Anzac Day, which is a day in Australia where we commemorate Australian and New Zealand people who went and served their respected countries in times of war. To celebrate this day, I'll be going over possibly one of the most iconic Australian firearms out there, the Owen Submachine Gun, the gun designed by a local boy that ended up helping to save Australia and the only indigenously produced submachine gun Australia ever made during World War II. The Owen gun originally started out as a project by Evelyn Owen in the 1930s, which honestly looks more like a discount version of the M1928 Thompson than an original design. Owen was a kid with a lot of interests in inventing stuff and would go on to put forth this weapon to the Australian military in 1939 at the age of 24. Hoping they'd accept it, he was disappointed when they didn't and would join the army a year later. The military rejected the gun for quite a few reasons. One was that the original 22 caliber version he made didn't have a safety or proper trigger, using a thumb trigger instead. Another problem being that the magazine couldn't be detached in a hurry, which is a problem for a weapon that'd mostly be used in a close range gunfight. The gun also faced the problem that at the time Australia didn't really see much of a use for submachine guns. One Australian army colonel said, quote, that is an American gangster's gun, the army has no use for those. And when they did realise there was a use for them, Australia decided to wait for a bunch of Sten submachine guns from Britain to arrive instead, since they decided to go with established weapons and companies instead of some random kid who just proved why gun control is rubbish by literally building a functioning firearm in his parents' house. Later on, however, after Owen had gone off to fight in World War II, one of his neighbours, Vincent Wardell, who was the general manager at Lysort Newcastle Steelworks, found the gun resting against a wall separating his home from the Owens, though some sources say it was leaning up against the Owens family's house. After Vincent talked to Owen's parents about this, Vincent would go on to further develop the gun with his brother Gerard and a Swiss employee of theirs, Fred Kunzler. Most people tend to say of how Owen was this super smart kid who invented this amazing weapon that single-handedly saved Australia, and even though this is technically true, this wasn't the case. He built the core of the gun, yes, but the Owen submachine gun as we know it today was all done by Lysort. I thought would also get Owen to come back and help on the gun, however, and put him on the Australian Inventions Board in Melbourne, but this was mainly for publicity in order to market it as the gun designed by a local boy that could save Australia from a Japanese invasion, which to the Australian people at the time looked more and more like a possibility, especially after the Japanese swept through the Pacific so quickly and even managed to hit the Australian coast in the famous bombing of Darwin event. According to Forgotten Weapons, Com, the army asked for the gun to be chambered in 38 Smith & Wesson, but when Lysort weren't supplied ammo nor a barrel, Lysort rechambered it to 32 ACP via using a part of an old SML Eve barrel. This reportedly was delivered just three weeks after being requested and worked well, and the army requested they put it through a 10,000 round endurance test. Again, just like when they had it in 38 Smith & Wesson, they weren't supplied ammo, and it would have been impossible to get that many rounds in wartime Australia. As a result, Lysort made a new gun, this time chambered in one of the most popular pistol and SMG cartridges out there, 45 ACP. Their reason behind this wasn't as an attempt to give it more stopping power, but it was because they hoped they'd be able to get some ammunition due to the number of Thompsons being used by Australia at the time. This is the point in time when you can imagine the face on Vincent Wardell when the army didn't send 45 ACP, but instead sent them cases of 455 Webley ammunition. As a result, finally having something that they can fire, they made one chambered for 455 Webley, and just like the 38 Smith & Wesson, it ran amazingly well. Though the first order was demanded to be 100 guns in 38 Smith & Wesson by the military. After all this lunacy from the military to try and derail the Owen gun, Vincent would go on to complain to politicians about this, and one of them would force the military to instead chamber it in 9x19mm parabellum. Politicians, just like Vincent, his colleagues, and Evelyn Owen, were sick of the army's games and wanted the gun given a fair chance. 
Just to talk about the final cartridge, it was chambered in for a brief moment. The 9x19mm Parabellum cartridge was invented in 1901, or sometime around there, and has since been one of the most popular pistol cartridges around, being very effective for close range gun fights for the military and law enforcement, or even for civilian use in home and self defense. It's a very short and stubby round, with the 115 grain one being used by the Owen gun. The main reason it was chosen for the Owen was due to it being the same cartridge used by the British Sten, and as mentioned earlier, Australia was expecting a bunch of Sten guns from Britain. As an interesting side note, the way it got the name Parabellum was because the company that first manufactured the round had their slogan as Latin for, if you seek peace, prepare for war. The Parabellum bit meaning prepare for war. Getting back to the gun itself, both the Parabellum and the 45 ACP Owen gun prototypes would end up competing against two much more famous submachine guns of the Second World War, those being the M1 Thompson from the United States of America and the British made Sten. During the testing, alongside the other guns, the Owen was tested in water, sand, mud, and basically whatever they thought could render the gun unusable. The Thompson managed to survive the sand test, but the Sten utterly failed, and surprisingly, the Owen gun was the only one that could survive it all and keep going in the endurance tests conducted. It did this due to its upside down magazine and two chamber receiver both elements helping the gun stop dust and other elements affecting critical components that could result in it jamming. As a result of this, the military were forced to pick the Owen, despite senior officers having more of a preference for the Sten at the beginning. Due to how well the Owen performed, how cheap it was to produce, being about $30 per gun in the 1940s, and being easy to mass produce, you may have already guessed the army got scolded in newspapers for not adopting it sooner. The Owen that'd be accepted into service had a muzzle velocity of 1250 to 1400 feet per second, or 381 to 426.7 meters per second. It had a length of about 32 inches with a 9.7 inch long barrel according to ForgottenWeapons.com and had a fire rate of 700 RPM, though ForgottenWeapons.com lists 700 to 800 RPM. Also, according to ForgottenWeapons.com, the Owen gun used a 32 round stick magazine, though some sources say 33 rounds. And the gun also weighs between 9.5 and 10.5 pounds, or 4.3 to 4.7 kilograms. Other stuff says 4.21 kilograms, though the weight is dependent on the version you're talking about. According to Internet Movie Firearms Database, there were also 60 and 72 round magazines produced. However, these wouldn't make it past the prototype stage. From what I've read, people found the gun to be fairly heavy, so I can see why you wouldn't want to add even more weight to it. According to a video I watched from the Forgotten Weapons YouTube channel, most submachine guns of World War II only had two modes, safety and full auto. Meanwhile, for some reason, the Owen gun had safety, semi-auto, and then full auto. Some records of the gun also report it was prone to burst fire in semi-auto mode, though I remember Ian from Forgotten Weapons saying he reckons this was just due to poor quality control early on in full-scale production, which I'd say is the most believable due to this being the first gun Australia made and produced entirely on its own. Before I go on to its service, however, I do just want to quickly go over other variants of the gun made. According to ForgottenWeapons.com, there were only two main variants, though according to Internet Movie Firearms Database, there was at least five. The first one was the Owen Mark 1 42, which according to the Internet Movie Firearms Database, has a trigger mechanism chamber pressed from sheet metal, uses what I like to call a coat hanger stock, and has ribs at the end of the barrel to help with cooling the gun faster. Some wireframe stocks on these Owens also had a clip for oil bottles. The Owen Mark 1 43 had the fins or ribs of the barrel removed, and it featured a wooden stock, alongside a trigger housing featuring lightning cuts, though some exist with wooden stocks that lack lightning cuts. This version was designed to be lighter than the Mark 1 42. The Mark 1 44 was basically the same as the previous model, but instead came with a mounting point for a bayonet taken from a number 1 Mark III SMLE rifle. 
The Owen Mark II was designed to have a reduced trigger compartment and wooden stock with a different shape and mounting method than the Mark I's. According to the Australian War Memorial, only 200 were made for prototype trials and it never saw service. There was also an attempt to modernise the Owen in the form of the Owen Mark I 1952 version, but just like the Mark II, this never went anywhere. When it came to its service life, the Owen gun served Australia all the way up until the 1960s, with one of the last conflicts it served in being the Rhodesian Bush War. The gun was found to be rugged, simple, reliable, and stoppages were very rare. The sights were mounted to the right side of the gun, which made it slightly annoying for right-handed shooters, but this didn't matter much, since according to one source, Owens were mainly fired from the hip during World War II. However, this doesn't mean the Owen gun was the perfect weapon, nor did its creators have the perfect life after it. Evelyn Owen would later become an alcoholic after World War II, and used the £10,000 he got from the gun to set up a lumber mill, though would die at the young age of 33 on April 1st. He continued to tinker with guns up until his death, but none would become anywhere near as successful as the Owen gun. Lysol, on the other hand, didn't do much better either, and got shafted by the military more than them just demanding different calibres during one of the most stressful times in Australian history. They came to an agreement during the war of a 4% profit mark, but payments were delayed until 1947, three years after they had stopped all production of the gun entirely, and whatever money they finally got was closer to a profit of 1.5%. The gun also started to show some signs of age in Korea and Vietnam. One Vietnam veteran left a comment on KoreanWarOnline.com's page on the Owen gun, saying they had an accidental friendly fire with one resulting in a 2 inch penetration and that the weapon performed poorly in Vietnam. Adding that worn weaponry and ammo from 1943 wasn't a good combination and that he refused to carry one opting for the Australian version of the FNFAL self-loading rifle instead. Another comment on the same website was from someone who fought in Korea, saying that at about 100 metres and past it, it wasn't very effective against Chinese soldiers wearing thick winter clothing, though another one commented saying both British and American soldiers were very happy to get their hands on Owen guns whenever possible. When it comes to media appearances, the gun has appeared in the films The Cow Breakout from 1984 and 2006's The Bow of Long Tan, the 2010 documentary series Kokoda, 2013's The Railway Man, and 2019's Danger Close, The Battle of Long Tan. It has also made its way into the realm of video games, first with 2014's World of Guns Disassembly, 2016's Heroes and Generals, 2017's Day of Infamy and Rising Storm 2 Vietnam, and its latest appearances at the time of this video being the 2021 games Call of Duty Vanguard, where you can customise the gun to your liking, including somehow making the gun even uglier, and the free-to-play game Enlisted, where you can either get it in the Battle of Tunisia campaign for the British in the form of a premium squad, or if you're like me and you are a cheapskate, you can simply grind through to campaign level 15 in the Pacific War campaign for the US and unlock it that way. One thing I should note, however, is that in Enlisted, it seems like the model animations need a little work, since I'm pretty sure the casings are meant to fall out the bottom of the gun, not eject through the top unless you're firing it upside down. For those wondering, yes, it is actually possible to fire the gun upside down, according to ForgottenWeapons.com. To end this video, the Owen gun is probably one of the best submachine guns of World War II, and one of the best guns of all time. Besides some minor problems here and there, it was the best Australia could do for the time and is very impressive, since Australia isn't a very industrial country. Despite showing its age later in life, it served Australia well until it was retired in the 1960s. Sadly, if you want to own one in Australia, that's not going to be possible due to strict gun laws, and according to some research I did, though forgot to list in the sources section, all the ones owned in Tasmania were confiscated after the 1996 Port Arthur massacre. And even if Australia didn't have some of the strictest gun laws in the world, it'd still be hard to own one due to there being hardly any surviving working examples around today all of them having either been scrapped, turned into demilitarised museum ornaments, 
or Americans are too greedy to give up their own Owen guns. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video, enjoy Anzac Day, and don't forget to like and subscribe. Anyway, see ya.